Hello, and welcome to a special report on METV. I'm Charles Clapsaddle, Station Manager for Manatee Educational Television. And on this special report, we're very privileged to have with us two individuals who are going to talk about a very serious issue in our world, and that's the situation in Israel and in Gaza. Please help me welcome Jesse Seslow and Isaac Azarod. Isaac and Jesse, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this issue has been in the news for several months now. Uh, it's an es a, a situation that's escalated and diffused and escalated again. But having you two on today's program will give our community a little insight and knowledge into what's actually happening in Israel. And, but before we begin, I'd like to get a little background on both of you, if I may. First of all, Jesse, we'll start with you. You are the Director of Community Relations? Yes. Tell us a little bit about your background and your involvement with the Jewish Federation. Uh, well, my background um, is um, I'm the daughter of an archaeologist. Every summer when I was a child, I spent in Israel on archaeological excavations uh, in the south, um, which is where, unfortunately, a lot of rockets are being rained down on into. Mm -hmm. um, I studied in high school on the nifty Eisendrath International Exchange, which was in the year 2000, and that was when the Second Intifada broke out. So I have lived, um, I have lived through terror attacks in Jerusalem. And then following that, I studied in Beersheba at Ben-Gurion University. So uh, that all has led me to <laughs> what my passion is, really, and that is educating about Jewish history and, and Israel. Well, the Jewish Federation is very fortunate to have some of your background and knowledge and experience, you know, to, to be their director of communications. And, and I want to go to Isaac for a moment, but first of all, just give me a general background about what the Jewish Federation does for this community. Well, what we do is um, we, we enhance Jewish life and enhance, um, you know, all that, that happens in the Jewish world um, mm -hmm. here in, in Sarasota, Manatee, mm -hmm. in Israel and around the world. We are a fundraising organization, mm -hmm. so if there are any people in need around the world, we raise the funds to help them. And you also play a significant part in kind of educating the community too about you know providing uh, speaker series, outreach throughout Sarasota and Manatee, is that mm -hmm. correct? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, we have plenty of departments. We've got a Holocaust department with a Holocaust Speakers Bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of um, uh, survivors that live here in the community, so bringing them out to uh, educate about their experience with uh, students and adults alike is extremely important for us. Absolutely. Uh, never forget is one of the major slogans of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we provide that kind of education. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of um, community partnerships. Uh, we work with All Faiths Food Bank, mm -hmm. um, Selby Botanical Gardens, Moat Marine. Mm -hmm. we're, we're out there, and um, we, we, we love being a part of this community. Well, Sarasota and Manatee is very fortunate to have a very active, a very generous, and a very uh, proactive Jewish community, and I think that's really important. And and, and do you find that <laughs> both Sarasota and Manatee you know, are very active with the Federation? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Sarasota a little more, but we're really working to get into Manatee a lot more. You know, for my particular position, uh, I'm also in charge of a program that's very important called the Heller Israel Advocacy Initiative. And uh, we have a committee which is made up of half Christians and half Jews. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of our co-chairs is Pastor Joey Mims at the Bethel Baptist Church here in Manatee County. <laughs> so we are... Uh, very fortunate. Yeah, we're very fortunate and we love working with the community members in Manatee just as much as Sarasota. Well, thank you for joining us today. And, you know, and I look, really look forward to this conversation that we're going to have about the situation in the Middle East. But also joining us today is Isaac Azarod. And Isaac, thank you so much for joining us. Looking I, at I your, thank you. It's my pleasure, sir. Looking at your background and your experience and everything, it's just fascinating. I, you know, if we have the time, perhaps maybe we can just do a program on Isaac <laughs> down the road. <laughs> But you know, you, you come from a very uh, uh, interesting background, and you were born in Egypt. Is correct, that correct? Correct. Well, uh, you, you know, my background is really intertwined with the history of the Middle East. Uh, born in 1946, two years before the uh, you, you know the the uh, Declaration of Independence of State of Israel, uh, I was born in Egypt. Um, 
And in 1961, we were forced out of Egypt through a whole series of uh, moves by the government that made it practically impossible to live in, in the Egyptian society, which we were very comfortable in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can go into more details at some point if, if that uh, you know, comes, uh, becomes uh, necessary. And from there, we moved to France in 1961 at a time where France was experiencing a huge influx of North African refugees. Uh, there are tremendous, uh, uh, you know, feeling of uh, xenophobia in France. There were anti-Semitism was rampant. Mm -hmm. um, it was, again, uh, you know, we found ourselves in a situation where uh, the environment was unlivable. Mm. We then moved to Israel. Um, as a young man moving in Israel, uh, I quickly learned the language and was drafted into the military. And in 1967, by an accident of fate, uh, I ended up fighting the Egyptians on, in the Sinai. In the uh, Seven Day War. In, in the Six Day War, Six correct. Six Day War. Um, seventh Day, I think we rested. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to make a long story short, uh, we, um, um, I started looking for scholarships, and a small school in Ohio offered me a full scholarship. I ended up in Ohio. From there, I moved to various areas in, in the state. I uh, got my MBA, then uh, I went into a PhD program, uh, started teaching school, then got ANSI, and went into the business world, and uh, worked in various, various jobs and ended up owning a design studio here in Sarasota, print shop. And this is where I am, active in the Jewish community mm -hmm. and active in the community at large as well. Uh, I sat on the board of the Federation for the last seven or eight years, I'm not quite sure at this point. Uh, I was vice president um, at one time. I am part of Jesse's committee. Uh, the uh, Heller IAI. Um, basically, um, as I stand, uh, like I said, very intertwined with uh, the uh, uh, Jewish community and with Israel. And of course, my mother, who's 89 years old, uh, lives in Israel and uh, spoke to her this morning. And she has a message for your audience. She said, let people know that the Jewish people choose life as opposed to death, which is one of the tenets of uh, our faith, and also that the Israelis are peaceful people. They just want to be uh, left alone and develop a country that is good for the Israelis and also a light unto the world huh. with all the good things that the Israeli society can produce for the world. Well, Isaac, I, I would suggest to you that, you know, with your rich background, you, not only are you uh, versed in English and Hebrew, but you also are versed in, uh, in, in French and, and, and Arabic, Arabic as well. Mm -hmm. So you have that kind of full and rich understanding, having lived throughout the world where this turmoil takes place, a rich understanding of how these, uh, how, how the situation develops. And, and I think that's really important to have someone of your background involved with the Federation. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, I do have, uh, in my humble opinion, some perspective, perhaps, that someone who has lived in only one country um, cannot afford himself to have or self to have. Um, basically, what, um, what I'd like to bring in is perhaps answers to some of the questions that uh, we often hear and perhaps also elucidate some of the misconceptions and Jesse can tell you about all the misconceptions that there are out there in the media. Uh, we've had a small conversation before we got into the studio mm -hmm. uh, about the level of incompetence, in my opinion, uh, of the pundits, the uh, talking heads, so to speak, on uh, television and in the media 
who have not taken the time to put things in perspective. Right. When, when, when you remove an item from historical perspective, you tend to lose the narrative that's behind it. For instance, if we consider the situation in the Middle East, uh, specifically with the, with the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, most pundits would frame that as a territorial war or a war of um, refugees. Mm -hmm. okay. um, it really was never a question of refugees. To give you an example, I could call myself technically a, a refugee. refugee. Um, when I left Egypt, we were part of an 80,000 uh, people movement out of e Jews out of Egypt to various parts of the world. Just Around the world. Around scattered the world. all over the world. As I speak to you today, I have relatives in 23 countries, last we counted. Um, so um, what happens to those Jews? Well, a lot of them ended up in Israel. So the importance of Israel is primordial to the, the, the safety of the Jewish people throughout history. Uh, that's one of the backgrounds. The second background that tells you uh, that it's a refugee problem on the part of the Palestinian, it is indeed a refugee problem because it was never taken care of. Mm -hmm. We are sitting here 60 some years uh, past the date at which time we should have perhaps looked at those refugees and how we can settle them, uh, what countries would take them in, mm -hmm. and to what extent they will provide them with services until they can flourish and grow on their own. Um, but the most important part, in my opinion, is that of the organizing principles of, say, someone like Hamas. Okay. And, and I can cite Hamas, or Fatah, or Islamic Jihad, or ISIS, ISIL, I can, uh, Boko Haram, uh, uh, Nusrat al-Jihad, you know, there are hundreds of organizations that organize their thoughts around the principle of destruction rather than construction. And I think that's a really essential point uh, to m mention that all of those groups that you mentioned are focused on destruction. They uh, put no value on the state of Israel. They have called for, repeatedly, the destruction, or the obliteration of the state of Israel. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, even the uh, so-called moderates, if we take, for instance, uh, Fatah, which is the uh, uh, political head of Fatah being uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, Abu Mazen, who is currently negotiating directly with Israel, has chosen to associate himself and form a unity government with Hamas, whose charter uh, calls for the annihilation of the state of Israel, the destruction of the state of Israel, more importantly, the killing of every Jew alive around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a narrative you can negotiate with. Yeah. This is not, you, you know, Israel is not negotiating with Canada or, or Mexico. And, and these, these uh, organizations uh, classified around the world as terrorist organizations, you know, have, have repeatedly, repeatedly called for the destruction of the state of Israel. And there are some of these organizations that are sponsored, underwritten by other, organ other governments. Correct. Uh, such, and we want to talk a little bit about, you know, Iran's involvement with this. But all of these organizations throughout the history of Israel have called for the destruction of the state of Israel. Uh, that's something that the state of Israel cannot tolerate. Which kind of brings us to the most recent conflict. And this is something that has been ongoing. Hopefully there's be some kind of resolution. But this is a conflict that, that flares um, repeatedly over a period of time. Uh, it was just a few years ago that uh, rockets were raining down upon you know, peaceful cities and peaceful villages and peaceful communities throughout Israel. Well, this time, 
it has increased. Um, and I think, as I mentioned to you, I can't think of another country in the world that would endure or put up with any kind of uh, unprovoked uh, attack. So just as a background, Jesse and Isaac, tell us a little bit about the situation and how that e has evolved and, and, and the kind of the response that Israel has, uh, has, uh, has accomplished. Jesse? Well, as, as you mentioned, it happens, it's almost cyclical. Um, you know, Israel has one of the greatest armies in the world, second only to that of the United States, because they have to because it's about every two or three years that we see um, an escalation of violence um, coming from either the Gaza Strip or the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned in my bio earlier, <laughs> suicide bombings are one, rockets, katushas, mm -hmm. and it happens a lot more often than we in the West understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the reason for checkpoints to get into, Gaza, uh, to get into Israel Right. rather is to, to prevent, prevent that. that. And um, I mean, I have friends years ago who were working in, in the military uh, and they were at these checkpoints and they have stopped women and children among men mm -hmm. who have had bombs strapped to them. Mm -hmm. It's thanks to them that on a weekly basis, I don't want to go as far as to say daily but. but and I understand that I think you know periodically you know before this most recent uh, uh, conflict you know that there there's that periodic thing where you know somebody will be come on a bus and will blow up a bus mm -hmm. and it's a tragedy it's constant state of, of, of terror and fortunately you know Israel is very very vigilant in trying to prevent that but you know to a peaceful population and I oppose this to both of you to a peaceful population to have to endure that kind of threat of of constant violence, it is, it's got to be, you know, nerve-wracking. And, and Isaac, you mentioned your 89-year-old mother. I can only imagine what she would be going through, and all those people in Israel would be going through, children alike, to have that constant state of terror hanging over their heads. It is, uh, first of all, it, it's extremely disruptive from a psychological standpoint, of course. Uh, but also from a health standpoint, uh, you tend to shelter in, neglect your basic needs. Uh, you cannot go see your doctor as often as you wanted to. Um, you are fearful for your life. If you're a very young child or an elderly person, you also have the physical inability to get to a shelter within uh, sometimes as as little as fifteen seconds to get mm. to a shelter. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's. I mean, it's it's not just possible. Un untenable, of course. Um, and aside from that, the economic impact of a war that has been started by someone else to destroy you is difficult for a small country regardless of how uh, wonderful and how productive the economy is, it is still a toll. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, billions of dollars have been spent, um, and of course, the funerals. I mean, there are, uh, there are the Israelis take every single life uh, that is lost at heart, uh, unlike any other conflict, we know every name, we know the age, we know the family. Uh, many have gone to funerals uh, as if it were their own son. Uh, it's a very, very solemn occasion. And also what uh, Golda Mayer said at one point is, we can forgive the Palestinians for killing our children but we cannot forgive them to force us to kill theirs. Mm. And that's, in my opinion, the encapsulation of the frustration mm. that exists into that, uh, that, that conflict. And, I, and I call it a war, I really shouldn't call it a conflict. Yeah. And, and even though the results are the same, it's, it, you know, there are casualties, there's wounded. I would think that the response, and, and this is where I would welcome your, uh, your input, 
is that a country has to respond to violence. You can't let it arbitrarily continue on. And I think in every conflict, every conflict, that Israeli has been involved in is that they have to respond and they have to respond forcefully and I think you know within the media and the news media there's been a lot of talk of what they would consider a disproportionate response you know what are your comments on that and and we'll start with you Jesse well I uh, I think that the term disproportionate response is completely inappropriate to be used um, when it comes to uh, a, a war um, you know, saying disproportionate response uh, is implying that Hamas doesn't have the ability to uh, keep their civilians safe. And is it the ability or is it the will? Mm. Um, you know, they've received billions of dollars in aid uh, over the past 10 years uh, since since Israel left got the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. And with those billions of dollars, they haven't built infrastructures, they haven't built bomb shelters, they built tunnels in order to, to create infiltrate more in, terror. And to in infiltrate, the, and that's exactly. a, you know, a, a, there's a whole network, according exactly. to most sources, uh, that you know, kind of infiltrate in, into Israel mm -hmm. at the most vulnerable sites, schools and farms, and, you know, and, and I Absolutely. think that's an important note to make. But also, I, I would like to hear your, your uh, thoughts on the fact that during a conflict, and you know, whether we call it a war or a conflict or you know, whatever the terminology is, is that one has to respond in the way that you're going to prevent future occurrences. Uh, and I would think that would be the most appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And as I think you mentioned earlier, uh, Jesse, Israel has like one of the most proficient military operations in the world. Effective, dedicated, committed, knowledgeable, all of those people. They're there to protect the citizens of Israel. That's correct. And I think that's the important thing to, 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 for, uh, for people to understand mm -hmm. is that you're protecting a state. Absolutely. You know, Isaac, what are, what are your thoughts on it's first, uh, I'd like, you know, lest we sound maybe a little bit uh, focused on one side, I'd like to mention that every single life that is lost is, it's is it's a tragic. tragedy. It's, it's tragic. a tragedy for humanity. It's a tragedy for the Palestinians. And it is a tragedy for Israel. It is. And, and Israel has not chosen to do that kind of uh, response. But Israel is forced to do that kind of response. The, the response is commensurate with, with, the, with the actual aggression. Uh, in order to dislodge the Hamas fighters, hmm. they are obligated to go where the Hamas fighters reside. Unfortunately, uh, they have chosen, the Hamas fighters have chosen, to locate in schools, hmm in mosques, in hospitals. churches, in mm -hmm. hospitals, in, in UN facilities. They are shooting rockets out of homes, um, tunnels. It becomes a very difficult asymmetrical uh, attack. Consequently, there are casualties. The casualties are often civilian casualties because they're intermingled. Mm. The other aspect that is not talked about is Hamas doesn't wear a uniform. So you don't know if you have killed a Hamas operative or you've killed a young man who happens to be shooting a rocket because it's kind of, mm. you know, what they do. So you don't know. The other aspect of what we need to talk about when we talk about proportionality. Proportionality implies proportions, which means that the proportions are known on both sides. Well, the proportions are not known on both sides. The Hamas and the Palestinian casualties are reported by the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. of Hamas on the Palestinian side. We don't know. We just know that in past conflicts, when the dust settles 
and the numbers are recalculated, it is far from what actually has been reported. But what galls me the most, what really um, infuriates me the most, is the number of Palestinian casualties that are killed through what we call here friendly fire, mm. what they call in Israel an accident, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a work accident, they call it. Uh, not to be flippant, but a lot of those rockets, because they are crude mm -hmm. and because they are uh, shot without too much skill and knowledge, end up on the top of Palestinian homes. Mm. A lot of those casualties are self-caused casualties from uh, the Palestinians. But, but also, too, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that on this most recent wave of terrorism, and yeah. that's what in this movie, that, that uh, Hamas is using much more sophisticated, longer range things that, will be, that can go to other targets. I think a few years ago they were using much shorter range uh, rockets, Correct. but now with the influx of state-sponsored money, as you mentioned, they have additional range to, you know, virtually, you know, pretty much throughout Israel to reach targets, which is an unfortunate thing. And one of the things I'd like to mention is that it seems to me that if there's individuals who say, well, you know, this is disproportionate, and it's, one would think, well, we didn't start that uh, conflict. We weren't raining rockets on you, but now that we're responding, there seems in the media this thing of, of well, you know, perhaps, you know, it's too much, too much of a response. Mm -hmm. what are you, what's your reaction? Well, you know, I, I suppose what I would do is try and make a parallel between uh, a recent event that has happened here in the United States so that Americans can, can feel as though they understand what Israel is going through, and that is 9-11. We didn't invite it. It came to our home, mm. and what did we do? We, we went to find the people who were responsible. Was that disproportionate? Analogy. It's a very I good analogy. I, I, I don't think it was disproportionate. Mm. Thousands of Americans were killed, and, and the state of our national security was, was put into question. That's it's exactly what point. happens in Israel and to Israelis on a daily basis, especially in a conflict like this. And I, I would think, again, you know, living under that constant threat of rockets coming in. And, you know, and as you mentioned, Isaac, Israel is a very vibrant state. It's a very successful democracy. Uh, it's very successful in business. It has the most IPOs anywhere True. in the world. Yeah. It's very full of entrepreneurs. You know, it's on the cutting edge of, uh, of science and medicine. Mm -hmm. So Israel is, even though it's, it, it, it's very conscious of its defense, wants to live a peaceful, Sure. Life. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, oh, right. Now, one of those things, and you know, I want to get back to a little bit about this that that I want both of you to talk about is because of this recent conflict, or in spite of it, there's been this surge around the world of anti-Semitism. Uh, some of it, people say, kind of is emanating from Iran, which is uh, you know very anti-Semitic state. But it's also kind of permeated into Europe. And there's been a surge of this in capital cities during protests. And it seems every once in a while, and Isaac, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you know, this kind of comes and goes. But every time it raises its head you know, of, of this hate and, and bias, it seems to kind of like filter out into neighboring states as well. And you know, having lived through that for you know throughout Egypt uh, and 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 into France, how do you feel that this is uh, happening? Yeah. Well, um, anti-Semitism, like you said, very accurately, is cyclical, and it takes on additional identities uh, throughout the uh, permutations uh, over the years, and depending on what part of the world. Uh, you know, you experience the anti-Semitism. Uh, let's take Egypt, for instance, which I know well since I was born there. 
I remember being a five-year-old child uh, traveling through Cairo with my father and my mother in, in, in the little fiat that we had. And it was in 1952, and it was the Egyptian Revolution, one of the first Egyptian revolutions that ended up toppling the king over there. I remember the buildings being burned, and I remember uh, people shouting, uh, slaughter the Jews, hmm. even though the Jews had nothing to do with the king, you know, except that perhaps we had some friendly relations with the local. Uh, 1956, um, we went through uh, the Sinai campaign where um, the uh, French, English, and Israelis attacked in order to secure the Suez Canal. And uh, again, we were targeted as, you know, part of, uh, uh, you know, this conspiracy to destroy the country, the Jewish conspiracy. Mm -hmm. My uncles were put in jail for three years because they belonged to uh, B'nai B'rith, which is a, a social organization. Social organization. You know, it's a fraterni fraternal organization. Uh, my father was taken at uh, gunpoint because he had a press badge on the car, which he shared with my uncle, who was the editor of the French newspaper there. Hmm. So those are some of the manifestations of anti-Semitism. What, what has become more virulent over the years is the access to social media and the access to large crowds, mm. uh, very, very large crowds, and the huge immigration of uh, Muslims from Arab countries, specifically from North yeah. Africa, uh, and from Africa, Somalia, Malaysia, and all the rest. Um, immigration into Europe and Scandinavia, uh, they have formed huge pockets of hatred against the local government, and specifically against the Jews. And they're conflating the events of the Middle East mm -hmm. with their anti-Semitism to the point where there is no distinction between the two. And I, and I know you and I discussed the distinction between a Zionist, a Jew, and an Israeli. And, an Israeli. and in the eyes of uh, a Middle Eastern, an Arab, there is no difference. It's all one. It's all one. They're all Jews. They're all Jews. So to make a distinction that doesn't have a difference built into it in, is erroneous, and it also does not depict the right uh, picture of what is happening in, in Europe right now. Um, a lot of hatred and... Things are manifesting themselves now in violence, very similar to the early days of the Nazi doctrine being, you know, uh, propagated throughout uh, Germany. Uh, there are destruction of property. Right. There is killings. Uh, in, in Belgium, for instance, they had uh, an attack on the Jewish Museum. They killed um, three people in there. Uh, in Miami, believe it or not, a rabbi, Rabbi Raskin from uh, Brooklyn visiting in Miami was actually uh, killed. I believe he was knifed to death. Yes. And um, we don't know if it's a hate crime. Yeah. On the other hand, we also know that the following day, the synagogue that he was visiting was plastered with swastikas and whatnot. So. Yeah. Uh, the, the danger of hatred multiplied by the accessibility to social media will eventually create a crisis of sorts if we don't, at this point, have a clear mind and a clear strategy to combat the kind of anti-Semitism that is starting to propagate. And, and I think, too, and, and, and Jesse, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment. I think, too, and I think you nailed that on the head, with social media, you can virtually poison anonymously over and over again. And I think that's a, a clear thing. Before, maybe 30, 40 years ago, you know, anti-Semitism was that close thing, and it was crowds and just general bias and ignorance. But now with social media, you can p 
propagate a lot of type of things quickly, efficiently across the globe. And I think that's an ugly, ugly thing that's happening. Jesse, what did you think? Yeah, well, what I, what I wanted to add is, you know, we see um, flare-ups throughout history. Sure. The most recent big flare-up, what I would call a flare-up, was in the 1930s. And, and it is almost identical, what we're seeing today. Hmm. And, you know, hmm. we've seen over the past one, two years, uh, smaller anti-Semitic uh, pieces of violence, mm -hmm. uh, a man wearing a kippah in France killed here, uh, a woman in Sweden because she's wearing a, uh, a Star of David necklace is beaten by mm -hmm. a mob of Muslim men, mm -hmm. small things like that. And, and yes, what's going on right now with this conflict with Operation Protective Edge has exasperated that, but now it's just putting it more on the world's uh, and the forefront for the world. Now we're seeing, and, we're, and, and it's uh, against a minority group, the mm. Jews, not against the, the country or the state of Israel. You're seeing signs that say Hitler was right. Mm. Gas and, the Jews. And, and I think, again, as Isaac mentioned, it comes up, it flares up. It's like that you know, perpetual disease that you can't uh, you know, find the cure for. You, know, you can put it to rest, but then it will flare up again. And I think, too, one of the things you just mentioned is that due to this conflict, you have this massive influx of media mm -hmm. you know, that's covering every nuance of you know, what is happening. And at the same time, that media footage is being used to propagate you know, hate uh, a continued hate and aggression. Mm -hmm. So I think that I see the, the media be kind of becoming manipulated for other purposes as well. Absolutely, and, and because, because it is so apparent mm -hmm. that it is against a minority group, that these mm -hmm. protests are against the Jews, a minority group, the silence in the media is deafening. Mm. It is deafening, and it's not only against the Jews any longer. Now we, we look at ISIS, it's against so. Christians and Yazidis, and, and Silence, crickets. Yeah. Now here we are on August 20th of 2014, and you know, hopefully the truce and you know, some kind of brokerage, and I think the Egyptians were leading some of the uh, ceasefire talks, and uh, as of today, that's not happening, but in the future could, but, you know, but in the future, you know, we're gonna see some changes, I think. Hopefully, you know, this crisis will die down, Israel will be protected. But there are other threats and other things on the horizon. And, and I would like to hear your thoughts on what I would consider one of the biggest threats, and that's uh, Iran. Mm -hmm. And I think Iran has been uh, adamantly, adamantly opposed to any kind of uh, understanding with the state of Israel. You know, they, they're a state-sponsored uh, terrorist organization. They have financed uh, uh, many terrorist organizations around the globe. And they're also a big supporter of Hamas, uh, if, that, if that's correct. However, you have ISIS, who just this morning, I believe, brutally murdered an American journalist that they beheaded. had captured. Beheaded. Beheaded. Let's not uh, forget. Th it's beheading. That's, that's, a, that's a torturous, barbaric act uh, uh, for this organization. And then to take credit for it is even, is even you know, beyond my comprehension. And then threatened to do the, the same to another journalist. Mm -hmm. However, these state-sponsored ISIS and all these other organizations are on the horizon. They pose what I would consider potential threats to the safety and security of the state of Israel. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you know, first and foremost, um, ISIS and Hamas and Hezbollah and Boko Haram and Muslim Brotherhood, they're all related. Maybe they're not brothers, maybe they're cousins, but they're all related. They mm -hmm. all have money streaming in from similar places, mm -hmm. and um, they all have the same end goal. And mm -hmm. the end goal, uh, the, the, the near goal is to get rid of Israel and the Jews. The end goal is to come for the rest. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and again, there is a distinction between everyday Muslims and Islamic Jihad. And, and I think 100%. that's clear to, to make that. Uh, yes. That, that, that's important. a clear and it's distinct, very important. Uh, distinction to make. Yeah. yeah. But Is Islamic made? Jihad is terrifying. Hmm. And they are terrorizing normal, normal people in their own countries. They're moving to other countries. Right. They're taking over. They're, Islamic State of, of uh, Iraq and Syria. 
-hmm. That's what they want. They want to make two countries that have been pretty prosperous for a while mm. one. And they don't like the westernization and the modernization mm -hmm. of, 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 of their governments, which isn't, isn't so modern right. if you really look and, at and it. They're, they're pulling no strings on this, too. They're saying mm -hmm. that you know, we're, they're not satisfied until the complete mm -hmm. destruction of you know anything that's Western, anything that's you know pro-Israel, anything mm -hmm. that's pro. They they have stated that, and they're barbaric within their own community. Mm -hmm. And one can only say, you know, imagine what they can do, what they would like to do to other countries, peace loving, uh, loving people. Yeah, and it's important to mention you you stated earlier that um, the beheading of this American journalist was barbaric even for ISIS, and I disagree. Uh, they've been beheading Christians who refuse to convert to Islam, mm, even Christians, true. Christians who I have, stand corrected. yeah, Christians who have uh, converted to Islam. Even in doing that, they still behead them. And and I think you're you're exactly right, and I stand corrected it's on that normal. because they are a very brutal, uh, brutal, yes. barbaric yes. thing, and they and and they are on the horizon. Uh, Isaac, what, what do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, you, I, 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 I I know that Israel is very conscious and very aware of the state of Iran and what they you know what they pose. Absolutely, to. and you mentioned Iran a couple of times, rightly so, and lest we. Uh, keep our eye off the ball, we're going to end up in the situation where a, a rogue uh, government, a rogue state, and I'm not talking about the Iranian people, I'm talking about the actual leaders, mm -hmm. uh, if they end up with a nuclear bomb, I think we would be in such bad shape. Peril. Not, not Israel, the but whole the world. world. The whole world. If you imagine someone like Hamas having a nuclear bomb, what do you think they would have done in the last two or three weeks? They would have absolutely used it. Uh, and we are negotiating with Iran right now to give them the capability to slow down their production of fissile material to build a bomb, yet uh, have the capability of getting to that point at some future date. I think that is huge mistake. Um, even if they don't use it, if they use their influence through Hezbollah, through some of the other Shiite uh, right. um, fighters that are now fighting ISIS on, <laughs> ironically. Um, you know, you have the Shiite-Sunni uh, divide, but when it comes to Israel and America, again, Shiite and Sunnis think the same. They want the destruction of the Western way of the world. They want to take back the caliphate. Exactly. I say take back because in their minds, it's theirs. You know, Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, uh, this whole area used to belong to uh, the, the, uh, the Muslims and they think it's theirs. So they want to propagate through Europe first and they're going to go for the Jews, the Saturday people, mm. and then go through for the Christians, the mm. Sunday people. That's how they call us. So Saturday and Sunday, we're part of that weekend, you and me. Mm. So we have to be very, very careful. And, um, and I would suggest to you is that, you know, Israel has always been, you know, on the defensive, you know, from, from the creation of the state, uh, through the Six Day War, through one conflict after another. And eternal vi vigilance is, yeah. is, is, the, is the cost of, of freedom and prosperity and, the, and your democracy. I'm oh, sorry, Jesse. I was. I did want to say one thing. I, I um, it's. Im I think it's important to note that in, just specifically in Iran, if you look back, not even thirty, forty years, right. just before the revolution, uh, during the Shah. During yeah, uh, Iran was a modern country. Women did not have to cover their faces. Women could drive. Women could have jobs. Uh, you know, it didn't take that long for it to completely turn around, it, it doesn't have to take that long for the rest of the world if they're determined. Well, and I would say too is that, you know, again, and, and I think, Isaac, you mentioned it, you know, in very opening remarks, is that Israel is a peace-loving country, you know, very prosperous, peace-loving country. Uh, 
very small country, it, it, but very peace-loving. But the, uh, the, the price of that peace comes at a very high price. Um, right. You know, from, uh, from the sons and daughters that are called to defend Israel to the billions of dollars that are spent in its defense. So it, there's a very high price for that. Now, we're kind of winding down a little bit, and I, I wanted to have a, a moment for each one of you to kind of give us a perspective. And I think the best perspective is going to say, what, what do you see for the future? How do you see things kind of um, changing, or, or do you see them being able to change? Or is this going to be a constant uh, state of turmoil that from you know, every two years or three years, there's this sense of uh, uncertainty and, and, and a sense of, uh, of fear? Uh, well, for me, um, you know, of course, I, I want peace for the region. I want a two-state solution. I want the Palestinians to be able to thrive and prosper mm -hmm. without Hamas mm -hmm. and with a true democratic uh, you know, representation. representation. Mm -hmm. And I want, and I also, you know, Israel, I'd be remiss to, if I didn't say this, to, that Israel is made up of Christians, Muslims, and Jews, Druze, Bedouin, uh, members of the non-Jewish community who are so proud of their country and what it's True. accomplished that they even fight in the IDF. You know, if you look in Gaza right now, no Jews. Mm. No Jews. Mm. So we're looking at a country that has open arms versus uh, a small strip that is uh, run by a very hateful terrorist organization. And, 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 and without it, them, they can thrive and they can prosper. And, and, and I want to see that. And I think, it, as you mentioned earlier, too, is that there are a lot of peace-loving people you know, in the entire region. The, you know, people who want to thrive and prosper and have to send their children to school mm -hmm. and, you know, and live a good and you know, healthy and fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. And that's most of the population. However, that population is controlled by a very, uh, is a terrorist-minded, uh, a small group of, mm -hmm. uh, of people that kind of dictate what that situation, how that situation is going to evolve. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would suggest to you, and you, know, you probably know much more about this, is that because of the fact that they want to wage war, they're neglecting the needs and, and uh, of, of their own people within Gaza. Absolutely. And, and you know, well, whether, it's, whether it's water improvement mm -hmm. or schools or uh, sanitation, whatever, those needs are being neglected because they're putting those efforts in, into other areas of terrorist uh, applications. Well, top Hamas officials don't even live in Gaza or even the West Bank. I mean, I think Saeed Arakat might be one of the only, I mean, they live in Qatar or Qatar, whatever they're calling it these mm. days. They don't even understand the civilian population. So how can, they, how can they cater to the civilian population and what their needs are if they don't know what they are because they don't see them? That's, a, that's so, an excellent um, point. But in short, a two-state solution with safe borders. And secure borders. Safe and secure borders and prosperity all around. That's what I want. And you're the you're the face of the next generation. You're, you're, you're well, a very you. young woman. <laughs> and, you know, Isaac, on the other hand, is a little older, but... <laughs> But the thing is, is that, you know, it's the future for you and your children and your grandchildren that you want to look at mm -hmm. to make that possible for, you know, for generations to come. Yeah. Isaac, you've lived through it. You've, you've served in, 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 in the military. You've seen the disaster and the destruction. You've seen the prejudice and hate that, that goes on generation after generation. What do you want to see for the future? Well, you know, Charles, the... Um the Israeli national anthem is called Hope, Hatikva. So without hope, nothing can happen. Right. So we hope for a better world in which everyone can live in peace. Um, I perhaps are slightly more uh, attuned to uh, the vicissitudes of the area and what it entails. I think what is going to happen in the next few years is that Israel will maintain the situation as a status quo. 
mm. without solving it because you cannot solve it unilaterally. It has to be solved on both sides. That's a good point. Unless at some point in the future arises a narrative that allows for the existence of the state of Israel as a Jewish state within the secure borders that, that they are right now. So, or the 67, or the 67 with some modifications, or, you know, the, again, this is not a real estate issue. No. It really isn't. It's a narrative issue, and it's a, it's a zero-sum game. The Islamist on one side, and the zeros are us, Israel and America, because mm -hmm. eventually that movement is going to have more and more adherence. There are huge amounts of money coming in from Qatar, hmm. uh, huge amounts of money from even Saudi Arabia, as hmm. they are not happy with the situation, they are still funding it. Hmm. Um, the Europeans are super complacent about the issue. It's true. Uh, the Americans, we have endured 9-11, that was our first wake-up call like Jesse mentioned very aptly. Uh, but I'm sorry to say there will be other American targets hit, perhaps right. not here at home, but certainly in our uh, you know, presence in certain areas around the world. Um, that situation will go on and exacerbate itself up to a point where we would have to come in and fight it. This is something that's not going to disappear. Mm. We have we have to fight uh, political Islam at some point. And I think uh, the Islamists I think, are at the gate. And and I think too, as you see the rise of ISIS and you know throughout the and the, the contempt that Iran holds, you know, not only for worldview but you know for the state of Israel. At some point, at some point, there's either going to be a seat at the table or there's not going to be a table and mm -hmm. that's where the next conflict and as I mentioned that eternal vigilance is the yeah. price that all Israelis and all Jews are constantly having to pay for their sake of their freedom. I want to touch on one brief subject because uh, uh, we're kind of running down on time and that's the state of uh, uh, America and the state of Israel. Great partnership for decades and decades. How important is that to Israel to have that uh, strong relationship? And how do you feel that that relationship is, is bearing up under all this conflict? Isaac? Well, yeah. Uh, well, you can see I'm wearing it's a, great, a, great uh, pin. a clip, clip on uh, button here with both flags that are basically one and the same for me. Uh, we are democracies, both of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, the United States is the greatest friend that Israel has ever had and still is. Uh, there are personal differences sometimes between leaders and politicians. Uh, those come and go. Uh, the essence of what Israel stands for is the essence of what America stands for. And the two countries will forever be intertwined in their Judeo-Christian background. It's not something that's going to change. The level of communication may increase or decrease over time, depending on who's at the White House and who is in the State Department, um, what pressures they have on them. But the unfortunate part is that history reminds us, slaps us in the face every once in a while and tells us, you better get together because, again, the barbarians are at the door. Jesse, what are, what are your thoughts? Quite simply, the relationship between the United States and Israel is paramount. And um, like Isaac said, there is no greater friendship to Israel um, than, than with the United States. And, uh, and we need to see it remain and thrive. And I don't think that it'll go away. Hmm. It'll, it might fluctuate based on Every four, four years. Swings, you know, every four years. <laughs> um, if people want to find out about the Federation mm -hmm. and some of the things that you're doing or, or even to know about some of the, your outreach activities, how can they do that? Well, we encourage you to please visit www. Uh, 
uh, thefederation.org. Mm -hmm. And also uh, to learn more about our Israel advocacy and all of the events that we do to provide information and education about Israel, mm -hmm. uh, www.sarasotalovesisrael.com. Well, that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, pr simple. pretty good. <laughs> so we're going to have that information up on the screen, and I would encourage people if they want to find out more, kind of understanding. And I, you have a whole uh, uh, array of outreach programs that the Jewish Federation mm -hmm. does for schools, for you know, for individuals, for businesses. And I would encourage people to find out more about it. Um, now we only have a minute or so left. And I want to go around the table briefly, and you know, final comments, Jesse. You know, you know, we would first of all welcome both of you back for additional programs that perhaps might focus on different issues. I, I think you know this is an important conversation to have for a community, for a region, for individuals to understand the complexity mm -hmm. of the situation as it evolves, the 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 constant nature of what the the state of Israel has to go through and endure, because it is a very successful country. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, by any standards. It's a very successful country to do with and then being subjected to have to go conflict after conflict after conflict on, on it's almost periodically is is most unfortunate. So Jesse, what do you want this community to know about the Jewish Federation and, and the efforts that are being made well, in the state of Israel? Well, I, I am thrilled that we are on Manatee Education TV because at the end of the day education is uh, our greatest tool and we aim at the Jewish Federation to provide education mm -hmm. and to uh, make it accessible to people who would like it so education all around okay. very important yeah. and again thank you for joining <laughs> Isaac I'm going to let you have the last I, first word first of all Charles I, uh, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to express ourselves in such open forum and You've been a tremendous host, and thank you very much. And, and judging by your programs, I know that you have a, an audience that is genuinely interested in, in educating themselves mm -hmm. about the situation. Uh, I will urge everyone to look at things historically, look at them through a wide lens, and look at the narratives on all sides to make sure they understand the complexities of the situation. Not everybody can become an expert in it, but certainly everyone can educate themselves as to uh, what is going on in the Middle East. And, and become informed. And I, become I, informed. I just want to thank both of you personally for doing this and taking time from your busy schedule to discuss this. I think that being as insightful and as knowledgeable as you two are gives our audiences some insight into this very complex manner and we would welcome you back for future programs to discuss a wide variety of issues that are not only facing us here in the United States but in Israel and around the world because I think you know the community would welcome that opportunity and, and especially from the two of you uh, who have just been wonderful today and I thank you very very much. Well, thank you for having us. It is my pleasure. And thank you for joining us on this METV special report. I'm Charles Clapsaddle for Manatee Educational Television.